Good morning, friends, and welcome to the Friday morning chats. And I have believed that we've been going for quite a long time now. And today, something of interest to us all. David Wood's talk, and he's titled it Solar going ballistic in Bristol. David. Yeah. And so when when um Patsy asked me for a title, which is great, asked me if I'd do a talk, which is great. Uh, and I did want to do something on energy. And I was I don't know whether I was being flippant or what, but I said sort of solar going ballistic in Bristol, which it manifestly is not, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> You know, and, you know, I don't want to uh, uh, be a false prophet, but I want to address the address, address the issue of what might make it go ballistic and what's stopping it going ballistic. So I've got some I've got some slides uh, and I'll talk us through them and we'll see where we get to. Um, and I've, and if it all fails, I've got some notes. Now, I think I started my slides. Safari. You would think. Right. Can you see um, a slide yet? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, so this is, we've, we've already done a bunch of energy talks, right? Um, and the last one was age of energy abundance. Is it closer than we think? It was pretty much a year ago. And uh, with Patsy, we came up with the idea solar going ballistic in Bristol, which it isn't. Um, so the question then became, what do we do? By the way, uh, this is me being a little bit clever. That QR, can you see a QR code? Yes. Yeah. Well, if you aim your camera at that, it will give you, it will link to the write-up of this week's talk, which is kind of fun. Um, yeah. But that's just me playing with technology. Um, so, but... What is true is that solar is still growing exponentially. And um, exponential growth seems very gradual because, uh, you know, just growing like 60% a year, that's, that's not very much. But when you look over a few years, things have changed a lot. And I hope to sort of cover that. Um, oh, that was funny. Those arrows moving around. That was clever. Um, so in the Age of Energy Abundance talk, I talked about some of the history of what's been going on in Bristol, starting with the peak oil report and ending up with City Leap. And then I projected exponentially forward. Uh, and as you can see, I'm I'm expecting basically three big steps from the beginning of last year. And um, no, from earlier, the beginning of the year before. And, you know, I'm expecting it to be huge by 2030, but we aren't there yet. We are in 2024. That's where we are. And we're still playing around with plans and pilots. But that means that things should be sort of moving forward, moving into place. And so that's kind of why I called it, um, I, I want to call it energy snakes and ladders. Because at the moment, uh, it, it seems like a good analogy. There's some good things happening, um, and there are things <clears throat> standing in the way of progress. So I thought, you know, I was much play, playing around with this a um, couple of days ago, and I thought, uh, okay, so um, how would we represent this? And <laughs> that's funny. I fed it into Bing, which is microsoft's search engine which now has artificial intelligence attached to it and the possibility to draw pictures and i just said draw me a picture of a futuristic snakes and ladders game with snakes and ladders and it's based around energy um and it sort of came up with that energy snakes and ladders and it actually came up with a few examples so here's another one which I asked it to focus a bit more on electric cars and solar panels. So 
I, this is fantastic. You know, I mean, I, I, I could never in a million years come up with an illustration like that. And it came up with half a dozen in, in a couple of minutes. So um, I asked it to visualize a uh, future with houses with solar roofs and electric cars. <laughs> As you can see, it came up with this sort of surreal picture of a charging station and the guy sitting on, you know, that looks really weird. So um, and I said, oh, that's not quite what I'm looking for. Could you like draw me another one that sort of came up with that? Electric car on a solar roof. It's not quite what I wanted, right? Like, how about like a street scene with solar roofs and electric cars? And it came up with that and uh. that one. And I thought, well, yeah it's, yeah, it's okay, but I mean, it doesn't relate to us. So I said, can you give me a street scene based on terraced houses in a city street like um, Saxon Road in St. Werburgh's Bristol? And it came up with that, right? Um, uh, so ah. my jaw dropped. Um, and it, sorry, in the earlier ones, you can even see the solar panels on the roof. So like really weird. The panels are different sizes. They go off the top of the roof. Now it's getting a little bit more sensible. And then I said, OK, um, still looks a bit techno. Can you put children in the street? And it came up with that. And this one, which is my favorite, this is the competition winner. That's that's Saxon Road in St. Werburgh's in the future, visualized by an AI. And I sent that to a friend and they, they, they just thought it was a photo. I had to explain that this was drawn by an AI and they said, that's not possible. Anyway, so this was just me faffing around and having fun before I prepare a talk. Um, sitting at my computer doing stuff and feeling the power of AI to help me. And now I'm going to drop down into real world. Uh, and But the point is that that engine that I was using was created by a company called OpenAI, whose chairman and uh, chief exec is a guy called Sam Altman. And he's saying the cost of intelligence and energy are going to be on a path towards near zero. Well, I just got, you know, 20 illustrations for nothing yesterday uh, from which are as good as you could ever hope for from a graphic designer. We certainly won't get all the way there this decade, but by 2030, it will become clear that the air, and he's saying renewable and nuclear energy. We may not need nuclear energy. So last year, what gave me cause for hope and what made me think we could be close to an uh, age of energy abundance was books like Mark Jacobson's No Miracles Needed. And he's explaining in that book how a bunch of different technologies are coming together. They're already good enough to provide for all our needs. And he's saying uh, da, 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 da. wind, water and solar sources to ensure reliable electricity and heat supplies. Well, various miracles have happened, and I'm going to mention some of them under ladders. Um, and the first one is the idea from a man called Tony Sieber, who works with a think tank called Rethink X. Um, and they work with exponential growth forecasts. And they say um, that growth is exponential. Other people don't get it right. They consistently get things right when other people don't. And he's saying that the energy future that we want doesn't rely on wind and and solar and nuclear and everything you can get everything you need just from too much solar energy plus too much battery energy and within five well, 10 20 minutes you'll have a good sense of that i hope um that's tony sieber um talking at an event and being blogged by somebody i follow called the electric viking 
and he's talking to a bunch of oil shakes who are sitting there quite happily eating their nice food. And he's telling them that the oil age isn't going to last as long as they think. Now, this is this is a video and I'm just going to play you three minutes, three and a half. Matthias Sunday says that. And this is Tony. This is that's the electric Viking. I'm fast forwarding to about 330. And I hope this will capture the nub. Was it whether or not it was whether or not he was right or whether or not all the pessimists were right in his book. Solar Trillions. Tony Sieber wrote, the price of a kilowatt hour of solar electricity would be four to five cents in 2020, when the price was sitting at 30 cents when he made the prediction. Right, I predicted it. I said uh, PV was gonna drop by 80 to 90% in the 2010s. Boom, right, cross curves, gravity. Um, so, it happened as predicted, and today in many countries, including the U.S., I mean, in the U.S., 92% of projects waiting to be interconnected to the grid are solar or wind, and 99% of storage is batteries, right? Here's the convergence. It's happening. He was saying the price would go from 30 cents to 4 to 5 cents in only 10 years. The International Energy Agency, or the IEA, believed it would stay about the same. Even other so-called naive optimists like Ramez Nan, who believed in a halving between 2010 to 2020, in other words, a price of around 15 cents, turned out to be too pessimistic for what would really happen. Now for the price to do what it did, for Tony Sieber's prediction to be correct, it meant that the price of electricity had to fall by 90% in only 10 years. Just because he's been right historically, it doesn't mean that Tony Sieber is now right in his newest predictions. Now, of course, prices fell by 93%, so he was right. However, people are now saying his newest predictions are just crazy. You don't need seasonal storage. You don't need hydrogen. You only need one, two, three, five days of battery storage. Um, and it's a phase change transformation into a new system. Um, and essentially, it, it's non-linear. So why does it work? Well, what we found when we studied this was a new property which we call the clean energy U-curve, which says you can uh, essentially trade off uh, a storage and generation. So the more generation you have, the less storage you need. Uh, you know, it's not intuitive, but, but we found that. But, but it's along a U-curve. Right? So if you design the system for the bottom of the U, uh, you know, your derivative is equal to zero, then you get massive amounts of power, two, three, four, five times more power the rest of the year, which we call superpower. That's it. He doesn't pluck his predictions out of thin air. Okay. So could you hear that? It, it, yes. That's, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not, particularly clear, but I'm going to just make the points briefly again anyway. Um, and that that is, <laughs> this is what I, this is the sort of thing that I nerdily watch, right? And I saw that video at the beginning of the year, and then over the course of a week, there were a bunch more new announcements, including about solar panels. So, so these are the ladders. First of all, Tony Sieber is saying that we could get all the energy need, we need from exponential solar plus batteries. And there are loads of other possibilities, but Tony Sieber is saying this will be the cheapest one. This is what will give us cheapest energy. The next one is uh, there's a Chinese, largest Chinese solar panel manufacturer is now in the process of building 500 watt solar panels well when we started putting solar on roofs when the feed-in tariffs came in around about 2011 the solar panels you could get were 200 watts not 500 when we put solar on the roof of hamilton house in stokescroft the solar panels we put on were 250 watts 
if you paid a big premium, you could get 300 and 330 watt solar panels, but they were more expensive. So you could get more on the roof, but it cost more. Now, right now, um, the standard solar panels that you get at the regular price are 400 watt panels. And we're saying in a year or two, it's going to be 500 watts. So what this means is um, if you wanted to put four kilowatts of solar on a roof, it used to take 20 panels. Now you can do it with 10. And in a couple of years time, you'll be able to do it with eight. Your roof hasn't got any smaller. You're just using less of it. But what if you maxed out your roof? And Bristol has a study that says there's room for 500 megawatts of solar on the 98 on 98,000 roofs in Bristol. That's about half the roofs. Great. But <laughs> that was three years ago. In two years time, that 500 megawatts without changing anything becomes a gigawatt because the panels will be twice as powerful as they were three years ago. So that's part of the ladder effect. We're going to be able to get almost an excess of energy off our roofs. Uh, with the old panels, we found that an average house in Lockleys could generate as much electricity as it would use in a year. Well, with panels that are twice as powerful, it would mean and generate all its vehicle fuel as well. So things are changing. OK, um, here's another one. CATL is the largest manufacturer of electric batteries for electric cars in the world, makes a third of all the batteries. And at the moment, you can see what I've written there, um, people have range anxiety with their cars because oh the battery only does 200 miles and on a bad day it won't even do that i'm not even you know where am i going to recharge catl have announced that they are making a thousand mile ev battery and a group at mit working with lamborghini who are owned by volkswagen are saying they've also got a thousand mile electric vehicle battery so instead of nothing like the range of a petrol car we're going to have electric batteries which are twice the range of a petrol car crazy and tony siebert the other announcement you know the, the there, there are loads of obvious hundreds of obvious questions come to mind yes but electric cars are so expensive right uh you know a whatever it is costs 30 40 50 60 thousand pounds so tony siebert was predicting, oh yeah, and CATL were saying the cost of bat we, we we reduced the cost of batteries by a third last year, and this year we're going to reduce the cost by half again. Um, how does that happen? Um, cheaper materials, they're using different materials, and they're building robot factories. Robots will assemble vehicle batteries. Um, and so Tony Sieber was predicting that the price of electric cars would come down and it would be $12,500 by 2027 and $5,000 for a simple electric car by 2030. And he's saying his forecasting method, it, he's wrong now, but he's less wrong than anybody else because... 12 and a half thousand pound EVs have already arrived. 12 and a half thousand dollars. So this means you can buy an electric car cheaper than a petrol car. It's going to have a range longer than a petrol car. The battery life, the battery will last a million miles. They're already making million mile batteries. So what we're seeing is think you know things that were dodgy and iffy a few years ago are suddenly flipping just like they did with um digital cameras you know the first digital cameras were rubbish they were grainy people said they would never ever ever replace film photography and now you have three or four cameras inside a phone 
and the resolution is really, really high. And you can do things with computerized photos that you just can't do with a film photo. So I'm not even sure what my points six and seven are. Okay. Mark Carney, who was chair of the, who was governor of the Bank of England, was saying while he was governor at the Bank of England that companies that own fossil fuel reserves need to start getting worried because if we took all their reserves out of the ground and turned them from assets on your balance sheet into real money, it would create five degrees of global warming and we would eliminate life on earth. So he, when he stopped being governor of the Bank of England, he went back to Canada and he's now chairman of a company called Brookfield, um, Brookfield, Brookfield, Brookfield Asset Management. And he's saying that investments in electric vehicles and in, sorry, in solar energy and renewable energy are running at four times the level of fossil energy. Well, the question is, is it going to overtake? Well, there are already fossil energy plants shutting down because they're being replaced by solar energy plants because the solar energy is cheaper. And there are already whole economies announcing that their emissions have peaked and are starting to go down. So it's a matter of, and China will announce that this year or next. And the rest of the world will follow suit. That doesn't mean that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere isn't still going up, but it's the rate at which it's going up will peak and other, other things will improve. And then the other thing is we have massive support from our governments. If we elect the right one, Labour's going to invest 28 billion a year in a green industrial revolution. Uh-oh. Oh, oh um, sorry about that. Um, no, we aren't says Keir Starmer. So the difference between points one to six and point seven is that points one to six have got, sorry, somebody's calling me and I'm going to, um, points one to six are technical, point seven is political. And that brings us on to the topic of snakes. <laughs> uh, we can't trust our politicians. We can't trust our um, fossil energy companies. But technology is advancing relentlessly. So I'm going to describe some of the things that are standing in the way. At the moment, there is an arbitrary limit that you can only put about four kilowatts of solar on a roof without asking for planning permission. Um, why is that? The energy distribution networks have arbitrarily said, well, if you put loads and loads of generation on all the roofs, it could overload the grid. Uh, whereas if you put up a solar farm, they say, anytime you start overloading the grid, we're going to tell you to turn it off. And they could do exactly the same for households. But at the moment, even though solar panels are going to be twice as powerful, there's an arbitrary limit of uh, how much solar you can put on without asking permission on a roof. That needs to go. Secondly, suppose I generate some solar energy on my roof and I want to share it with you next door through the local network. Obviously, the electricity isn't going to get as far as a substation, but I'm going to pay transmission charges or my energy company are going to meter and charge energy transmission charges as if the electricity was being shipped from Drax, you know, from a power station the other end of the country through both the national grid and the local distribution network, not just your local substation area. So that, that seems insane. Uh, it is insane. It has to change. But it's, it's what I call a software problem, not a hardware problem. It's just an arbitrary limit. And, you know, we have to find a way to hack the system and then change the rules. Thirdly, uh, it's not easy yet to put a solar farm across the roofs of a city. And 
sell the electricity to an energy company and then have people pay for that electricity as they use it, which is what we want to do in the network that I'm helping form, a resilience network. Similarly, if you're living in, um, say, a retirement home or a bunch of council flats, you may have a roof, but you may have a load of flats. And the question is, how do you generate the solar and share it between people easily? Uh, and that's just a software problem. You ought to be able to put a big solar array on the roof of a place and just share the electricity between the users. So that's something to be solved. Um, uh, that's code for, at the moment, um, community energy groups are working, beavering away, trying to figure out how you get to carbon neutral. And councils like Bristol City Council with its um, City Leap exercise are doing the same thing. Are we working together and integrating it all so that we get to carbon neutral together optimally? No, we are not. So we're not even talking properly intelligently to create a smart energy system of the future. Um, point number six, this is uh, politically contentious. Uh, to a lot of people, including friends of ours, it's absolutely obvious that before you put renewable energy on roofs, you should first insulate houses so that you aren't using energy, right? The energy you don't use is obviously the cheapest energy. And I say, you know, it, it's completely obvious, but that's wrong. Um, it could take, uh, I did a project where it took six months to retrofit the house, probably costing about £50,000, and that would have reduced its energy need by 50%. Whereas in one day, we could have put 10 kilowatts of solar on the roof and generated more energy than the house uses in an entire year. So it actually, after a while, when, when renewable energy becomes really, really cheap, you can effectively stop thinking about the, the neat yes lovely to insulate and have a warm house but if the energy gets cheaper and cheaper then we're in a better state uh and seventh um there's a group lobbying the government to help uh communities um generate their own energy and sell it to themselves i've met the people doing this i'm not convinced that what they will do will work best for us yet so I'm calling that a snake because at the moment, government action as often as not, um, yeah, you know, trips up what communities are trying to do. Um, so um, Bristol set up its own energy company and for a while they required us to, to work with them. So that was blackmail. And then they sold the energy company off. So the project died and we lost 50,000 pounds in grant funding. So don't trust your government, uh, trust your own community. And um, okay, I've got two pieces here. One, does the, don't do the numbers stack up? And the other is, so how do we exploit this? But first I'm gonna show the numbers do stack up. Uh, there's room on Bristol for a gigawatt of solar panels, um, which would cost us 500 million to, um, it says 1.2 million. That should say 1.2 billion. That's a typo. So it could, could cost a billion. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. That's right. The panels cost 500 to 1.2 million per megawatt. The cost of Bristol would be 500 million to 1.2 billion for a whole gigawatt. It would generate a terawatt hour of electricity a year, which if you sold it at the retail price of 30 pence a unit, you would bill 300 million a year for it. Well, 300 million obviously pays off 500 million to 1.2 billion in three or four years or less. So you say, well, <laughs> let's not charge people what the current price of energy is. Let's give them a third or a half discount you're still getting 100 to 150 million a year, which is, and these panels last for 30 years, but that 100 to 150 million would pay off the cost of the panels in 10 years or less. 
uh, and it would create savings of 150 to 200 million a year to households. And it would create a payback to the community. We would, some of that money would go to the community. So the net result is we are able to cut the cost of electricity to 10 pence a unit. And once you've paid off the cost of the solar panels, then you would be able to charge people threepence to fourpence a unit for their electricity, a tenth of what you're being charged at the moment during this energy so-called crisis. Um, this is why during this year, another miracle, during this year, uh, I found somebody who wanted to form a resilience network, bringing together local community hubs and neighborhood partnerships, uniting them to adapt and mitigate to climate change uh, when they're already overstretched to do the things they're committed to do to reduce emissions, climate action. We're thinking we can help raise money by using them to promote community renewables uh, and and that communities generating their own energy is the best way to generate energy. Why? Because they'll pass on the savings to themselves, not to multinationals and governments. We have capital finance already potentially on offer, and we were smart enough to not rely on a Labour government saying, first of all, they're going to have 28 billion for this, and then, oh, no, they aren't. As Mark Carnes said, the changes are being driven by economics, not politics now. So it doesn't depend on waiting for government help. And a community centre could be the one-stop shop that you go to for all the advice and finance you need and could help organise these whole street demonstrations like I demonstrated in the first picture. So you have a network that brings together neighbourhood partnerships, community hubs and community experts, plus whatever other help is available in the community. This is from a proposal I did to um, basically to put innovation hubs in all our community centres so that you'd raise money for young people to do smart work. Uh, I'm right near the end. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, um, uh, I asked an AI if it would like to write a poem about the challenges. Um, and um, that's not to delay things. And it, it came up with some verses. Uh, not everybody likes poems written by AI, but I assure you, it's 10 times as good as anything I could come up with. I can't see the very top line. The sun is shining in the sky, a source of power clean and free. But many people wonder why they can't install it easily. The cars are running on the road. They need the fuel. They cause pollution. But there is a better mode that offers a greener solution. The solar panels and electric cars are cheap and efficient. They save money. But there are obstacles and bars that make the process hard and funny. The regulation and the laws, the taxes and the fees, the permits and the floors, the lobbyists and the sleaze. They all prevent the change we need. They all protect the status quo. They all ignore the planet's plead. They all resist the way to go. But we can make a difference. We can demand a better choice. We can raise our voice and influence. We can speak as one and rejoice. The energy dilemma is not a fate. It is a challenge we can face. We can adopt a new state. We can create a better place. And I'd like to add, I, I just asked the AI to come up with a poem about the energy dilemma, the problems we face getting to net zero. And that's what it came up with. And I would add, the it doesn't demand us to raise our voice. It just demands us to work together and say, OK, let's um, put solar on our own roofs. The money's available. Um, we don't have to front it and we're going to get cheaper energy. Um, in the same way, I fed the same ideas into chat GPT and asked it to come up with a pitch deck for a business plan. I'm not going to take you through it at all. But it came up with uh, half a dozen slides which described the problem, the solution, free shared solar energy, energy efficiency upgrades and climate change improvements, uh, and that we've got money potentially on offer, uh, what the partnership might look like, uh, project timeline, pitch to a seed investor, and additional info. And all this was an AI coming up with this in minutes for me. 
Um, so just to sum up and to add in one more thing, Elon Musk has just announced that he's building a portable eco home, energy efficient eco home, and it's two bedrooms and it's sort of like a mobile home. Uh, it's certainly removable and it's just $10,000, which is under what I pay for my rent in a year. So if you add on the cost of an electric car, that's going to be 5,000 and some solar and stuff, another two grand, uh, maybe an e-bike, uh, maybe an e-boat. I'll show you something about boats in a second. I'm right at the end. Um, for twenty to $25,000, you could have a house and a car and solar energy when a house in Bristol now, average price about half a million pounds. So a completely different economy is possible. And when I switch to... Um, Stop sharing in a moment. I'll show you an example of how that. So you could rent the whole thing. You could pay rent for £100 a week, and that could include a car, an electric bike, and a house, and all the energy you would ever use, all the fuel you'd need for the car and the bike. Ah, last shot. So talking of boats, um, oh, the fat guy on the right, that's me. This is what I've been doing for the last eight months. I've been building a boat and, my, and playing with my craft skills. The boat, if you look on the deck, you can see it's got cleats and fair leads, and I made them with my own fair hands. Um, and so we could have a talk about um, building, building, building and floating. We're launching it on Monday. Um, and so I'm not just doing solar energy while I'm waiting for the snakes to be, I, I guess where I'm waiting for a St. Patrick to drive the snakes away so that the ladders just work. Right. Um, but meanwhile, I'm building a boat. So there you go. Um, that's a complete feasible renewable energy future with just a few barriers in the way. That won't be there. I mean, I showed you where we are on, on a timeline. We've got six years to 2030 to implement all this, by which time I believe all the barriers will have been swept away and we will have good software that brings together, you know, solar panels and electric cars. Yeah, I mean, there'll, there'll be a million questions um, or, or there won't. But um, I'm interested to know what you think. Patty, you have a raised hand, I can see. Yeah. I mean, should I demolish my house and build an eco home then? <laughs> um, well, you know, that's that's, you know, uh, that, that's the danger of um putting ideas out there is people <laughs> jump, jump to uh, not entirely crazy ideas. I wouldn't suggest that you do that, Hattie. Uh, what I would suggest is that temporarily it makes it perfectly OK to build housing in floodplains. Because you're going to be able you're going to be able to move them. These are these are modular homes factory manufactured they're brought to the site unpacked and used and as soon as the water level starts to rise you can move them up into the mendips and the chilterns but meanwhile so um mobile homes if they allow you uh, the nimbies will, will they allow David. you it depends entirely David. how big it is yes An angela is shaking her head sternly at yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my, I, I, my, if i could just say my daughter and son-in-law and family live in york nearby yeah. is a floodplain it is if you start building on that floodplain as, as soon as the river in york floods the whole lot of them will be underwater you know you can't just dismiss geography geology yeah. just like that you know i suppose <laughs> what i'm saying is who do you mean by you it seems to me democracy is going to take a beating it's not gonna it's not gonna you know sorry but no, they, uh, i i so, so as a um as a profession angela uh i have worked on company turnarounds using things like dialogue and democracy. Mm -hmm. You will understand the democracy that we have at the moment is a democracy in name only. 
it's 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 not democratic it's not even representative it's certainly not participative and it certainly doesn't bring intelligence to bear so i'm saying that i'm saying that intelligent nerds are developing technologies and like as not humans will use them extremely badly and what i'm suggesting is that communities get together in groups so we are forming a resilience network to bring people together in community hubs for dialogues about their preferred future. Marion, I think you were wanting to say something. Yeah. I think. No, no, not the moment. Okay. No, I, th I thought your hand was going up. But yeah. My apologies. So, so there, there's a real possibility to have us. If the technology isn't there, then dialogue and discussion is a waste of time. If you suddenly find you could have an abundance of cheap solar energy and you could have low cost electric vehicles with incredible range, then you can have an intelligent conversation about what you're going to do. And protesters can stop protesting uh, to government and oil companies who aren't going to change and start working within their communities to deliver the changes that we want. But the floodplains in York are still a problem for my daughter and son-in-law and family and all the residents of that part of York, which is basically between the city of York and the motorways. It yeah. is so, you, so, so you have an intelligent conversation. The floodplain I'm thinking of is uh, St. Philip's Marsh in Bristol and all the area behind the sea wall from um, basically from Hinkley Point up to Oldbury. Uh, all of which is potentially below sea level, but is behind big sea walls. Um, but you can't get planning permission because it might be flooded within 80 to 100 years. It's not going to flood if it rains. It's going to flood if the sea level rises by 10 meters, which it will. And you will have a choice then of whether you build a barrage across the seven, which we will, or... Um, you just move the houses up into uh, higher ground, the Mendips and, and the Chilterns uh, and so on, which we will what, also do. What is to stop, at the moment, I'm just being devil's advocate a bit here, uh, what is to stop some nasty group of capitalists buying up millions of, social, of solar panels and then charging you rather extremely amounts of money for them? Well, I, I, I thought you would come up with a better one than that. Um, th there's um, uh, The answer is um, you would be stupid to just buy solar panels and stockpile them um, because the Chinese would just double their production anyway. Um, and uh, so, so it, nothing would stop, nothing will stop communities being able to access cheap solar panels. The better question is what's to stop the capitalists buying these cheap solar panels and charging you loads of money for the electricity anyway and just making more profit? And the answer is our roofs, they're our roofs. We can choose to put solar panel on them and we can, we can bypass the capitalists. And that is the uh, th there are books about this, but um, um, the best of these, Jeremy um, Jeremy Rifkin, um, is that right? I think that's the name, Jeremy Rifkin, with his book, The Third Industrial Revolution and the Zero Marginal Cost Society. There's loads of people who are explaining that we are shifting to an age in which communities can take power back into their own hands and what? reverse this historic theft that started under the Conservatives with Margaret Thatcher. Would, would Jeremy Rifkin be anything to do with Malcolm the politician? No. <laughs> he, he, he is a, um, a, a, a world-famous economist who advises governments on energy strategies and so on. And he's uh -huh. very, very good. There's a wonderful film uh, on YouTube um, uh, which is, you know, totally exultant. And I, I'll put a link to that in the notes. There you go. Mm -hmm. Gosh. <laughs> Marianne. Well, I was probably going to ask a totally irrelevant question, but, um, you know, we seem to be 
you know, you were talking about moving into an age of limitless energy. Um, um, and we also seem to be moving into an age of limitless fighting. Are the two connected? Sorry, limit, limitless is what? Limitless fighting. Yes. Wars. Uh, are they linked? Is there any, is, is, is there any link that, that we can use as a lever? Oh, yes, it? absolutely. Um, energy and wars are intimately connected. The Ukraine war is all about energy and it's all about oil. Uh, the war is funded by uh, the Russian government gets 60 percent of its income from fossil fuel energy sales. If countries became energy independent and generated their own renewable energy, states that use their oil surpluses to conduct state terrorism like Russia and Saudi Arabia would no longer have incomes for that. And we might actually have a far more rational world. I'm giving you the flip of the answer that you were expecting. Uh, we will have uh, countries will become much more independent when they're generating all their energy. Um, there will come a time, uh, there's a good question to be asked about uh, minerals being extracted in environmentally unfriendly ways to give us the renewable energy we want. No reason for that. It's just that companies exploit people when they can. But once you've got enough uh, electric batteries for electric cars, the cheapest way to get the um, lithium for the next generation of electric cars is, is to mine the batteries from the last generation. So, you know, we will reduce, reuse, recycle much more easily when energy is cheaper, because a lot of the cost of recycling is an energy cost. You can take plastic and turn it back into plastic or oil again if you've got free energy. So will that influence some of the wars in Africa? Um, I would hope that we will influence some of the wars in Africa. The people with uh, some of the best insights on creating um, peace are Quakers, and Quakers have community centers, which could be the basis from which we roll out renewable energy and help people have intelligent dialogues about how you create peace. War is insane. Uh, war, you know, uh, but as often as not, war is about scarce resources. And we are making resources scarcer through global warming. So if we eliminate um, the buildup of carbon dioxide, if we bring the planet's temperature back to normal, which will take time, we're, we're going to overrun. Things will get worse before they get better. But we need to work as hard and as fast as we can to get to energy that causes no fossil emissions. And then you create the space for peace. So there's a slide that's missing there. And um, that is, so what are Quakers going to do about all this? Um, and I think we should be at the forefront of it. There's already a big group of Quakers a national WhatsApp group supporting people to protest. But the protests are mostly shouting at banks and energy companies and governments, all of whom are committed to do nothing. Why not put our effort into getting renewable energy across the city and do the things like Bristol Central Quakers has done? It's got a solar roof. It's got a battery. It uses the building to... Um, house people when we when it's needed you know that's the sort of thing that we should be doing and promoting across the city like yourself i occasionally read scientific stuff from the net and one of the ideas which was put forward a number of years ago which i still think has the phrases legs is so is uh, power from the sun, where you, you have the satellites in space which collect the, the energy and beam it down to the Earth. Yeah. It's uh, the thought. There's, yes, there's another name for that. It's a directed energy weapon, right? Because you beam it down at different frequencies. It is believed by some that the fires in the Hawaiian Islands and in the, um, uh, what are they called? The, the, um, the ones off Spain, 
uh, were actually helped by directed energy weapons um, to to clear the land of uh, so that so that new housing developments could be brought in. So yeah, great idea. Very very dangerous. Potentially oh, incredibly expensive, uh, and just as easy to put solar panels on your roofs and get the energy from the sun from your own roof. If you put it on a satellite, somebody can then charge you the earth for it. Mm. Uh, whereas if you put it on your own roof, that's going to be harder. Mm. I wanted to just do a simple demonstration. I can't find the other part of it. Um, on my bike, I use, um, uh, obviously, I, I use click, clip on lights. And every time they get nicked because I forget to take them off, I was having to pay seven pounds a time for the lights, for new lights. And they took batteries and the clip on bit didn't work well and the front cover falls off and everything. Uh, but it was seven pound a time per light. So it's 14 pounds every time I have to renew my lights. And the other day uh, I saw something on TikTok uh, and it had a rechargeable light with, you know, incredible, a brilliant beam, really powerful and different settings. And it said, and it got a rear light as well. And it came in a package and I thought, well, there isn't, there's not room for a battery in there. That's not, that's not a light. It's just a reflector. They sold me something wrong, but I sort of played around with it and I found a button on it. And when you hold the button down for a few seconds, it turns out it is a light and it has got a socket. And even though it's smaller than any battery you ever buy, it's got a battery inside it. Far more advanced than the other one. Posted to me from China, arrived in 10 days, cost £4.62. Not £14. So, you know, that's... We, we are getting to an age where we're able to manufacture devices that don't use a lot of materials that provide a lot of function and make them very very cheaply um and the the generating our own energy is just part of it marion we've got a, oh, few, a minute on, left yeah sorry on 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 the topic of bike batteries yeah um, i i have had so much trouble from all the ones where you have to recharge them they practically hardly get me down the road yeah um, I've, I've now had to spend more. I've got one that cost twenty pounds, um, um, and and it, it is a bit better, but the, they you know, they're troublesome. And the, the rear light was even worse. And finally, the bike shop fished around and found an old style battery one, um, which actually works uh, really really well. And I don't have to keep fiddling with it, and I don't have to keep taking it off the bike. Um, and it, it does a brilliant job. So I, I'm kind of very frustrated with it, with the idea that you have all these renewable things, but they hardly work. And they're a lot of trouble. Well, I, I, I share your frustration. I was using little lithium ion batteries, but the point is the batteries are now, we are now, gen, the, the next generation of batteries won't last just a hundred charges. We, we will have electric batteries for cars that will last for a million miles. Uh, and that are, small and dense enough that they will drive a car a thousand miles on a single charge. So, you know, what you, what you are describing is the frustrations of an early user before the technology gets up to speed. Yeah. So if you discover one that actually does the business. Let yeah. Me... Well, I, I can give you the, I can give you the link, but you yeah. can go on TikTok and look up electric bike yeah. battery okay. and the, uh, I don't use TikTok. I oh, well. just about cope with my emails, but other than oh, that, well, it's, uh, you, can, you can still ah. use a link. It's as easy yeah. to use as shopping via Amazon, which some people. You, oh, you can, yeah, you can send me a link, but I don't think I can cope with, you know, penetrating the all the things that I would have to do. Well, to the link just TikTok. takes you to a website that, with with where you can buy it, and it's called TikTok, <laughs> as opposed to Amazon. Same same stuff. Oh, right. Okay. Nothing, nothing different than you've seen before. Okay. So, so I mean, this is, yeah. and, and ideally, we will have community centers where you can go in and have a coffee, and there are people who know all this stuff. It won't just be me preaching to 
my Quaker friends, it will be people who are fully trained and funded to support people in the community so that everybody who is currently struggling will know where they can go and get real, real help. That's what the possibility is. I think the phrase goes there. That would be nice. Yeah. Gordon, <laughs> Rosie, any comments or thoughts from you? We've I'm sure we can run over a couple of minutes and you haven't oh, said we'll run yet. over as much time as we want well, to. As always, David, with your presentations, it's kind of like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, what I so appreciate is just you, you, you managed to keep us hopeful, you know, uh, when there are dark days and we think this is all crazy. Um, uh, well, it's a, it's a real shame that the, um, Labour or potential Labour government have reneged on on their promise, um, mm -hmm. but I gather from from what you've been saying is that local communities can be very powerful. Uh, maybe I've got that wrong. Angela shaking her head. No, it's it's exactly exactly right. I mean, I chair a socialist environmental resource association in Bristol, branch of a, of a national one which was responsible for tilting Labour in the direction of the Green New Deal, which it had under Corbyn. And then when um, Corbyn was being defenestrated, uh, the new group come in. But That's fortunately, a nice Ed, word. Ed, Ed Miliband was still around uh, and he was instrumental in the formation of DEC for the Blair government and the um, uh, sustainable something or other. There was a, a, a sustainability group. And so this new policy came in under Starmer, but, um, and it's it's gone, you know, and that's politics for you. You know, something's there one minute and it's gone gone the next and you can't rely on it. And so the work that I was doing with Sierra for the last few years was entirely focused on communities turning things around for themselves and not being exploited by governments or disappointed by governments. And, you know, there was a moment of elation, a few months where we were thinking, oh, great, Starmer and Miliband have got it sorted. It's all going to be wonderful. And Community Energy England called an event and said, this government's policy is so wonderful for community energy that we should be um, campaigning for them. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I guess them sending... An e preparing an email now saying, you know, all bets are off. But I'm saying, no, I, I, that's what I was expecting. There has to be a fallback position in which we look after ourselves and eventually in which we get rid of governments who can't be trusted hmm. or, or send people to government who we would trust, not members of political parties who are required to toe a party line. Well, I've heard it said that um, that a lot of the changes that are needed are happening anyway, and and are going to be um, the result of sort of e e economics. Um, so that it, you know, it's, it's not like it's everything's gone completely a wall. But is well, that that's exactly what uh, Mark Carney is saying? Yeah. He's saying that the changes in rene that the changes towards. Um, fitting the planet for global warming are economic decisions. They're not political decisions anymore. Um, we are having investments in renewable energy are running at four times the level of investments in fossil energy. And, and, and that's without fossil energy companies necessarily slowing down. It's that they can't economically invest anymore because renewable energy is cheaper. And so they're they're doing their best to try and squeeze the last drop of juice out of their reserves, but um, ordinary people are saying, "Yeah, well, that's all very well, but uh, you know, renewable energy is cheaper," uh, mm -hmm. and so fossil energy plants are are being shut down. So you're you're right, Mary. And and this is this is technical. It, in in a way, it means that we are much of our government is actually not a democracy it's a tech and it's not state terrorism like in russia we we are existing around the world in a technocracy that is trying to deliver 
the solutions that people want with without polluting because it knows those are our human values. I believe that most capitalists would use any nasty, dirty trick or anything like that to get hang on to power. There is nothing they wouldn't do to actually uh, to, to, to keep hold of power. And we are, if we want this type of revolution, we can still have to fight for it. You know, it's not going to come easy. It, it's it's fair comment, Ray. Um, I I don't share that view. Uh, I believe that um, capitalism is a system that we have created for ourselves, uh, and it has been shown in law courts to be uh, the people who run businesses are required to run them to maximize profits. And the higher you get in a business, the more likely you are to be a psychopath or a sociopath. But the people working in businesses are often ordinary people who uh, are just trying to feed their kids, mm. to, to have a life, to work a profession. And I believe those people are in the majority and that um, businesses can be required to shift. This is Jeremy Rifkin's thing, you know, that the businesses could as easily be worker co-ops as they could be mm. capitalist PLCs. Quakers themselves made the huge mistake of letting the, um, you know, the, the great Quaker businesses uh, all turned into PLCs and got frittered away. If they had taken a lesson from the Rochdale pioneers, they would have turned all the Quaker businesses into worker co-ops instead. And that would have been a far more enlightened thing to do. But not one Quaker business that I know of um, went from its founders to a cooperative of the workers. And I, I think that's a that's a mark against the Quakers. And it's up to us now to re re earn our spurs by um, you know taking the lead in um, liberating our communities. Did, did the Barda Company? Um... Become a workers' cooperative. Oh yeah, uh, I, I I I believe you might be right, Marion. So I may be slandering the occasional uh, positive yeah. example, but you know, Cadbury's and Fry's and all them yeah. are now you know typically owned by Nestle or whatever. Anyway, mm. thank you, David, for yeah. your usual enlightened thought, mm -hmm. and. Um, <clears throat> That's we are now better informed. Good. Right. Next week, we have a very interesting discussion next week. We have Patsy will be speaking to Rosie about the life and times of Rosie. Lovely. I'm <laughs> look, looking forward to a trip down memory lane. <laughs> I heard I heard that you were looking for people to interview. So when when you get really stuck for people, then you can come and ask me. I I, I shall be on the phone within the hour, Marion. <laughs> well done, Marion. <laughs> really good. We we'll look forward to all of those. Yeah. Right, friends. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Time. Very, very interesting. Um, yeah, very good. I, I, I love, I love the links that you made with other, other things and how, yeah, sort of. Who's Thank you, Mary. I'd love to, I'd love to read, have the presentation, um, and I'd like to have the links to the bike. Button. Okay. Well, so the, there'll be a video, and uh, uh, there, there's a, there's a write-up going with this one because it, yeah. um, I want to circulate some of the ideas in sort yeah. of. Um, some form to my yes. zero group as well. okay thank you thank you there's again thank you don't know why bye bye